I've been on almost every major television station. I preached at every major conference around the world. And after a while, you realize that those are great moments because God's doing something through you. Mm-hmm. But just because God does something through you doesn't necessarily mean you're letting them do something in you. When God does something new in you, cherish it. Because your eternity is being built on the inside of you. You're becoming more like Jesus. Join the conversation and welcome to Inside Voice. Hello, friends, and welcome to today's show. I think you would agree that this is a unique time on the earth. You might say that it's the best of times and the worst of times. There seems to be a shaking from the White House to the church house and even perhaps maybe to your house. Well, my guest today is a leading Latin voice in America who has experienced some of the highest highs and the lowest lows. His mission is to use his God-given experiences to raise leaders that will win souls and make disciples who will influence their generation for Christ. Pastor Sergio is the founder of Heart Revolution Church in San Diego, California, Tijuana, Mexico, and Bogota, Colombia. He's the author of the books, The Heart Revolution and Paradox, The God Who Breaks the Rules, and over the years has been featured on radio and television. In 2021, Sergio de la Mora passed Heart Revolution Church on to his children, Timothy and Carissa Anglin, and is now consulting and preaching with leaders around the world. Pastor Sergio, you're the father of six beautiful daughters and you're the grandfather to seven wild and I must say also very beautiful grandchildren. And you're a friend to both my husband and I. And it's a real honor to share your voice on this program today, my friend. Thank you so much, Brenda. It is a privilege and honor for me as well. Thank you. Well, I'm glad you're here. And, you know, I, I want to start out by just giving a little bit of um I want to talk a little bit about your new podcast. Uh, tell us about what inspired you and how you're uh, be able to get the the message of restoration out to so many people. Yeah. Um, the podcast is called The Road to Restoration. And the premise of the podcast really symbolizes a lot of what you mentioned. The world is going through restoration. Uh, no one in these past two years mm. has not been impacted. Mm. And... So we're taking the idea that restoration is happening around the world, but not everyone is allowing themselves to be restored. So in the podcast, I say at the beginning, I say whether you are on the road to restoration, fallen off the road to restoration, need to be on the road to restoration, or weary of being on the road to restoration, this podcast is for you. The podcast also is the result of personal restoration that I've gone through over the past two years. Uh, The week before all the churches shut down in America, uh, Heart Revolution Church was transitioned to my children. Uh, I made decisions in the years past that required for me to sit down and release the ministry to my children and take a time to rest, to be restored, to recover. And during this process, God started speaking to me and mentioning something to me that I thought was odd, but I took it to heart. He said, Sergio, your voice was used in a generation and in an era that it was needed to be strong, personality strong, spirit strong. But now I need your voice to be known as a voice that understands brokenness, compassion, empathy. And so in the process of brokenness, I believe it was God uh, giving me a new voice for a new generation that I had no idea that was going to need it because when you're going through restoration, you think you're the only one. When in reality, God doesn't do anything to us. He does things for us so that he can later do new things through us. Oh, that's so good. And I know that, you know, 
it, it's through our pain that, that that true beauty is experienced. We don't get there without pain. And uh, the compassion of Christ is really formed in us when we walk through those things. And as he is restoring us, what what's your hope t- for people to gain uh, from your podcast? I think the, the goal of the podcast is to do that, to inspire hope that God can do more in your latter than in your previous years. Mm. Because when you go through restoration, the thought is, I'm losing, I'm losing, I've lost. But that's a God of restoration. So um, if you go to my website, SergioDelamora.com, we do a campaign called Campaign 42. And we use the number 42 as a number of restoration, mainly because Job 42 is when God restored everything back to Job that he lost. Also in Genesis 42 is when God restored Joseph back to his family. Also in Isaiah 42 is when God said, if anyone will cry out, restore, restore, begin to restore families. So the hope of the podcast is to help people discover that God has more. It's the hope. That there's more in God for you and I. And I think right now in the world that we live in, because there's so much uncertainty, there's, there's so many questions, and there's been so much pivoting that's had to happen in people's lives. The reality is we don't take change very well. However, in the new book that I'm writing right now called The Phoenix Factor, I talk about that growth is a result of crisis. Crisis will always lead you to pain. Pain is what leads you to change. Change is what leads you to growth. So anyone that wants to grow, just know it's probably going to be because of a crisis that occurs and the crisis leads you to excruciating pain. And it's the pain that causes you to make change or gives you the option to make change. And the change is what gives you new growth. And so I encourage people through the podcast, simply this, don't give up in the process. Don't give up, give up, don't give up, don't give up. That's so good. And, you know, we live in a culture really where people tend to, it's our propensity to run from pain. Uh, you know, we want to run for the golden ring and we tend to bury our pain alive because we don't want the suffering. And I think that even in the church, wouldn't you agree with me? We've really moved far away from the idea and the concept of, of taking up our cross and, and what suffering will render. And there is a, you know, I think there's a concept even that, you know, when God takes us through a fire uh, and brings, you know, uh, correction to our lives, that it's just his wrath and his anger, but really it's our loving father and his mercy that will walk us through those things because his goal, the end goal is restoration. Um, Can you speak to that? I believe that the church has moved into an era that it's more honest and more authentic. That I could say it this way, God isn't letting anyone get away with anything. That now more than ever is the time to live Christianity and to embrace the process of discipleship. The reality is, Brenda, because I've grown a mega church, the fastest growing church in America, three years consecutively. You learn over the years as the church grows and multiplies that the church did really well at making believers, but not disciples. What COVID revealed is that COVID revealed who were believers and who were disciples. See, a believer will go to church, but a disciple will say they are the church. A believer wow. will go to church to sing songs. A disciple goes to church to worship the Lord. A believer will go and perhaps give an offering. A disciple will go to give their tithe. A believer will celebrate the cross of Christ and what it did for them, a disciple will carry the cross because they know the mission. So I think what's happened is that the church has moved 
from developing believers to now focus on developing disciples. And also the church theologically, I think, has changed from no longer seeing suffering as something negative as much as seeing suffering as part of the sanctifying process of God in our life. See, the ultimate goal of Christianity, and I think as a mega church pastor, we, uh, we preach so much to so many needs in the church and in the community that sometimes we, we find ourselves preaching a lot of heartfelt needs, which we need to because people are in desperate situations. However, the goal of the church and Christ's goal and the Father's goal is to make us like Jesus and to make our character reflect Christ, to prepare us to go to heaven. See, I think we have to embrace again as a church that the purpose of the church is not just to thrive on earth. The purpose of the church is to become the bride that God is preparing to go to heaven. So if you're going through character issues and if God is dealing with your character and you're experiencing consequences, it's not a time to look at it as if though God is against you. It's best to look at it as if God loves you so much that he's forming the character of Christ in you so that when you're in heaven, you reflect Christ. So the truth is all of our testing and trials on earth is just to prepare our character to be. Does that make sense? Yeah, it really does. And, you know, uh, Paul often quotes the the saying, the rain falls on the just and the unjust. And I I think that, you know, we have equivocated God's blessing with just walking in favor all the time. But we we need to expand our idea of what his favor really is. And And you're speaking to that. Um, you know, sometimes it's those seismic events in our lives that shake us and move us into a deeper place where we can actually hear what we have not been hearing. And uh, I, I think there is a real awakening that's that's taking place also within the body of Christ right now. Speak to that where it brings us to the place of total vulnerability um, you know, there's a scripture in, uh, Corinth, uh, I believe it's in Corinthians, that talks about, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, talks about standing before the glory of God, which is a mirror with our face unveiled. Well, you know, oftentimes, uh, Sergio, we're, we are playing games, we're, we're projecting images because we're trying to, to uh, project the image of success. We, we want to be noticed and recognized for how great we're doing. Um, and we want significance and purpose in our lives. And oftentimes it's very sincerely motivated, but God wants to get to the deeper parts of us that perhaps we're ignoring and we're allowing um, falsehoods and deception to come in. And uh, in these terrible events that leave us feeling like, oh my God, I have no life left. My future is gone. Can you minister to that person right now who is feeling that way and has absolutely no hope? They don't, but they are hungry for hope. Brenda, I really like the way you're describing this era of the church and well, the era of our society. Um, I want to say to whoever has lost, whoever's experiencing deep grief, whoever's feeling loneliness, on the outside, it looks like and it feels like things have come to an end. The reality is, and if you can receive this, that the old you cannot go where the new you is going. Oftentimes, we want to take the old us and experience the new us simultaneously. It's not possible. Jesus said he can't even put new wine into an old wineskin because both would be destroyed, both the wine and the wineskin, because he has a desire to save the wineskin. When you're going through life-shattering, life-altering circumstances, it's those moments that God draws closer to you. 
It's those moments where you can sense that the Holy Spirit has taken over. He's commandeered the ship of your life. And it's because he wants to reveal his faithfulness to you. During these past two years, I went through a marital crisis. I went through a material crisis where I felt like everything that I built was taken from me because of bad choices that I made. And there was a season that I was alone. And in that moment of being alone, I really felt like, God, what happened? And I felt like God told me, Sergio, I'm not done telling your story, but you have to give me permission to have the pen. Stop writing your own narrative. And you have to trust me and believe that where you have placed an exclamation point that it's over, that I have permission to put a comma and to finish the story. But one of the things I've had to learn, and I hope those that are listening would embrace, is that the only strategy during crisis is to surrender. Surrender is the strategy. I'm, I'm reminded of the four lepers in the book of 2 Kings chapter 7, when there was no food in the land, in the city, these four leopards said, let's go and surrender to the Perhaps we will live, perhaps we won't live. But the idea is that they decided, let's just surrender. However, in the surrender, they ended up coming upon a camp where they had more food, food enough for them and for the city. And so sometimes it's in our surrender that God reveals everything that you need, you already have. And our finite mind are constantly working a narrative. And that narrative oftentimes is, is the result of things that we hear, things that we see. And this mind works. It creates an algorithm. Everything that you've heard during the day, everything that you've said to people, everything that you've seen with your eyes, your mind gathers all that information, creates an algorithm, and then it spits out a narrative or a situation, and you start believing it because you're thinking it. And that's where we have to learn, and I had to learn, to take captive my thoughts and tell myself that is not the truth, that is an assumption, and go back to the Word of God and realize that His thoughts are always higher than my thoughts. His ways are always higher than my ways. I think one of the greatest errors that we make in our generation is that we put too much emphasis on our thoughts. We really think we're that smart. And I think we have to remind ourselves that God's thoughts are higher than our thoughts. And sometimes we could be tempted to put our thoughts above God's thoughts. And so when a person goes through crisis and they go through deep loss and there's grieving and there's deep pain, there's always a choice. David went through this in 1 Samuel chapter 30. And the Bible says in Ziglag, in one day, he lost everything. Everything was burned up in one day. All of his men wanted to stone him and he was distraught. Everyone was weeping and crying. Just imagine and I know those of you that have experienced loss, you know that, sh that feeling that causes your bones to shudder and it causes your nervous system to go off the Richter scale because what was normal and what we, you knew what was consistent is no longer. And you're holding on and trying to hold on to something that you could depend on. But I want us to look at what David did. The Bible says in 1 Samuel chapter 30, when everyone wanted to stone him, he strengthened himself in the Lord, and he asked the Lord, what should I do? And the Lord responded, and he said, David, you will pursue, overtake, and recover all. I want to say that to someone. Whatever you're going through, however dark it is, however uncertain things are, know this. If you and I will seek the Lord, he'll give you the same strategy. It may be a little different, but it'll ultimately be this. Pursue God, overtake what's overtaking you, and you too will recover all. And I believe that God's restoration plan 
is always better than what you had before. Let me say this. My marriage wasn't restored. And people told me, well, if God blessed you, it would have been restored. I said, well, you're right. But I'm not in control of all the choices of people in my life. But I've discovered this. Things may be different, but they're better. And they're better because I'm better. I've become a better man through it. And so can others. So can you who are watching. Things may not turn out the way you want, but that doesn't mean you have to stay the same person in the process. And I think you'll discover that in the midst of the fire, you'll find the fourth person, Jesus. Just like the three Hebrew boys, they made a decision. Whatever's going to happen, we're going to go through the fire. And I want to encourage you, whether or not you're seeing things be restored, whether you're seeing things crumble before you, make a decision like the three Hebrew boys that you're going to go through the fire. And in the midst of the fire, I guarantee you this, you'll know Jesus in a new way. You'll know the man in the midst of the fire. And the Bible says when they came out, their hair wasn't singed. They did not look like they'd gone through the fire. And it even says it looks like they, they, they didn't smell like they were in the fire. You know what I say? That when you go through a hard time, you'll come out looking like it was the best season of your life, not the worst, because you won't have the scent of bitterness, of anger, frustration, unforgiveness. You'll keep declaring that God is good. You'll keep declaring that your best days are ahead of you and not behind you. And the only way that can happen is that you and I have to make a decision to seek God afresh. Get into the presence of the Holy Spirit. Slow down. Read the Bible. Confess your sin. Be honest about where you are. The anointing, Brenda, as you know this, is always on the real you, not the trying to be. And I think we need to set aside now all of the fantasies that we've conjured up in our minds of what our life has to look like to be successful. I think in this era of my life, I've learned this, and I hope this helps someone. It's not so much what God does through me anymore that excites me. It's what God does in me. That's what you know, I've been, I've been on almost every major television station. I preached at every major conference around the world. And after a while, you realize that those are great moments because God's doing something through you. Mm -hmm. But just because God does something through you doesn't necessarily mean you're letting them do something in you. Mm -hmm. And yeah. you know what I'm Amen. That when God does something new in you, cherish it because your eternity is being built on the inside of you you're becoming more like jesus I believe that is so good the greatest mm. need is to become more like jesus so amen yes that's so good and it it really um i think that is helpful to uh dispel a lot of our, our past concepts of uh, even where we find identity. This is where we find identity in Christ. As we embrace the brokenness of our humanity and we stop trying to, uh, uh, you know, convince everybody that, you know, I've just got it all together and uh, putting our value in how God moves through me or the, the opportunities that I have uh, been favored with, but rather, what is God doing in me? I love that, Sergio. And I'd love for you to also um, that to speak to how that points to the joy that you can have even in the midst of that fire that you spoke about, because you know those those Hebrew children, not only did they come out not smelling like smoke, but what all the shackles that were on them were burned off. They came out free. And so I want you to speak to the joy that can take place, the joy and the peace that can take place unspeakable in the midst of tremendous challenge and heartbreak. That's really a, a great thought, 
Brenda, because most people don't consider pain and joy to, to coexist. But that's the paradox of God, right? That's good. Simultaneously, while you're going through your worst year or day or month, is when you're sensing the greatest touch of the presence of God on your life. And I genuinely believe this, that for so long we taught that brokenness was a predecessor to greatness. When the truth is, brokenness is the blessing. It's not the latter to blessing. You know, sometimes we look at brokenness just as a season of our life. And let me hurry up and get out of brokenness so I can get the promotion. You know what I've discovered <laughs> is that when you realize that brokenness is the promotion, mm. being oh. broken is the joy. Because mm. brokenness is when you're most authentic. And when you're most authentic and vulnerable and transparent, isn't that what Paul said in 2 Corinthians? When I am weak, then I am strong. And he said, in fact, I'm going to boast about my weakness, my disasters, all of the shipwrecks that I've experienced, because it's in those moments that I experience the presence and power of God. So my encouragement to people that are going through the fire, that you can stay in joy if you will keep your eyes on Christ and know this, that God knows where you are, he knows where you need to be, and he knows how to get you there. I imagine Job in chapter 31 was not very happy. But what he didn't know, that chapter 42 was on its way. And maybe you're in chapter 22, and you're on your way to Job chapter 42. Just know this, that joy in the midst of adversity is the greatest assault to the enemy. Nothing an offense to the devil. Nothing is what I believe a bombshell to the kingdom of darkness that when you choose joy over discouragement and depression, because joy has nothing to do with your outward circumstances. It has everything to do with the inward disposition of your heart. You mm -hmm. could be in it all. I mean, Brenda, I know what it is to lose more than, than I ever thought I was going to lose. Yeah. But what I realized is I didn't lose my joy. Right. I was still in scripture. <clears throat> I was still listening to worship. I didn't understand where I was going, but I knew who was leading me. Yeah. And I think that so casually today. <clears throat> but if I would have had this conversation with you a year ago, it would have been with tears rolling down my face. Because I had no idea, but I learned the weapon called joy. And joy gives you the ability to have God's perspective. That's why the enemy wants us discouraged and depressed, because he wants us to lose the perspective of God. But when you stay in joy, you know. You may not like where you are, but you know where you're going. Absolutely. And I can so relate to everything that you're saying because I walked that myself and my husband has walked that road and it, you are absolutely right. That was so beautiful how you said that the blessing is the brokenness. And I, I just want people to really understand that in this time, as we're experiencing such deep levels of brokenness and grief and question. Listen, this is God pouring out his heart and his mercy and his love on you. Uh, I'd like to, for you to, in the next couple of minutes, even speak to identity. Uh, we actually only have about one minute for the show to end, but in 30 seconds, let's just talk about the healing of identity. We're in a fractured world. There's a lot of confusion uh, that's taking place for so many people. Where are we going to find the healing for our identities? You know what I've had to discover that if I try to find my identity in anything that is not eternal, I'm always going to end up thirsty and returning to the well. Our identity the first be that we were chosen, called, and selected 
before the foundation of the earth and that Christ died for us. If the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ is not enough to make us feel special and unique, we're always going to struggle in our identity. And that's so true. And <clears throat> my friend, I just want to tell you how proud we are of you. Uh, you are walking the, the genuine walk of uh, discipleship as a follower of Christ, and you are discipling others as you show his glory in your brokenness. And that's all we're called to do. And so we just want to say we appreciate you and thank you for being here with me on the show today. Um, I hope we can do this again. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you very much. Well, we bless you. And uh, to you, my friends who have joined in today, I am confident that you are encouraged and that you have taken a, a deep drink from this well. And we want to encourage you to continue to just follow Christ and allow him to teach you what true joy is, what true peace is in the midst of your brokenness. You are blessed. Thank you for joining me. I invite you to come again next time. I'm Brenda Crouch.